Chapter 8 of The Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 8 The Dance of Death. Through the luxuriant tangled vegetation of the Stingian jungle night, a great lithe body made its way sinuously and in utter silence upon its soft padded feet. Only two blazing points of yellow-green flame shone occasionally with the reflected light of the equatorial moon that now and again pierced the softly sighing roof rustling in the night wind. Occasionally the beast would stop with high-held nose, sniffing searchingly. At other times a quick, brief incursion into the branches above delayed it momentarily in its steady journey toward the east. To its sensitive nostrils came the subtle, unseen spore of many a tender four-footed creature, bringing the slaver of hunger to the cruel, drooping jowl. But steadfastly it kept on its way, strangely ignoring the cravings of appetite that at another time would have sent the rolling, fur-clad muscles flying at some soft throat. All that night the creature pursued its lonely way, and the next day it halted only to make a single kill, which it tore to fragments and devoured with sullen, grumbling rumbles as though half famished for lack of food. It was dusk when it approached the palisade that surrounded a large native village. Like the shadow of a swift and silent death, it circled the village, nose to ground, halting at last close to the palisade, where it almost touched the backs of several huts. Here the beast sniffed for a moment, and then, turning its head upon one side, listened with up-pricked ears. What it heard was no sound by the standards of human ears, yet to the highly attuned and delicate organs of the beast a message seemed to be borne to the savage brain. A wondrous transformation was wrought in the motionless mass of statuesque bone and muscle that had an instant before stood as though carved out of the living bronze. As if it had been poised upon steel springs, suddenly released, it rose quickly and silently to the top of the palisade, disappearing stealthily and cat-like into the dark space between the wall and the back of an adjacent hut. In the village street beyond, women were preparing many little fires and fetching cooking pots filled with water for a great feast was to be celebrated ere the night was many hours older. About a stout stake near the center of the circling fires, a little knot of black warriors stood conversing, their bodies smeared with white and blue and ochre in broad and grotesque bands. Great circles of color were drawn about their eyes and lips, their breasts and abdomens, and from their clay plastered coffers rose gay feathers and bits of long straight wire. The village was preparing for a feast while in a hut at one side of the scene of the coming orgy, the bound victim of their bestial appetites lay waiting for the end. And such an end! Tarzan of the apes, tensing his mighty muscles, strained at the bonds that pinioned him. But they had been reinforced many times at the instigation of the Russian, so that not even the ape-man's giant brawn could bulge them. Death! Tarzan had looked the hideous hunter in the face many a time, and smiled. And he would smile again tonight when he knew the end was coming quickly. But now his thoughts were not of himself, but of those others, the dear ones who must suffer most because of his passing. Jane would never know the manner of it, for that he thanked heaven, and he was thankful also that she at least was safe in the heart of the world's greatest city, safe among kind and loving friends who would do their best to lighten her misery. But the boy! Tarzan writhed at the thought of him, his son, and now he, the mighty lord of the jungle, he, Tarzan, king of the apes, the only one in all the world fitted to find and save the child from the horrors that Rokoff's evil mind had planned, had been trapped like a silly, dumb creature. He was to die in a few hours, and with him would go the child's last chance of succor. Rokoff had been in to see and revile and abuse him several times during the afternoon, but he had been able to wring no word of remonstrance or murmur of pain from the lips of the giant captive. So at last he had given up, reserving his particular bit of exquisite mental torture for the last moment, when, just before the savage spears of the cannibals should forever make the object of his hated immune to further suffering, the Russian planned to reveal to his enemy the true whereabouts of his wife whom he thought safe in England. Dusk had fallen upon the village, and the ape-man could hear the preparations going forward for the torture and the feast. The dance of death he could picture in his mind's eye, for he had seen the thing many times in the past. Now he was to be the central figure, bound to the stake. The torture of the slow death as the circling warriors cut him to bits with the fiendish skill that mutilated without bringing unconsciousness had no terrors for him. He was inured to suffering and to the sight of blood and to cruel death, but the desire to live was no less strong within him, and until the last spark of life should flicker and go out, his whole being would remain quick with hope and determination. 
Let them relax their watchfulness but for an instant. He knew that his cunning mind and giant muscles would find a way to escape. Escape and revenge. As he lay, thinking furiously on every possibility of self-salvation, there came to his sensitive nostrils a faint and familiar scent. Instantly every faculty of his mind was upon the alert. Presently his trained ears caught the sound of the soundless presence without, behind the hut wherein he lay. His lips moved, and though no sound came forth that might have been appreciable to a human ear beyond the walls of his prison, yet he realized that the one beyond would hear. Already he knew who that one was, for his nostrils had told him as plainly as your eyes or mine tell us of the identity of an old friend whom we come upon in broad daylight. An instant later he heard the soft sound of a fur-clad body and padded feet scaling the outer wall behind the hut, and then a tearing at the poles which formed the wall. Presently through the hole thus made slunk a great beast, pressing its cold muzzle close to his neck. It was Sheeta, the panther. The beast snuffed round the prostrate man, whining a little. There was a limit to the interchange of ideas which could take place between these two, and so Tarzan could not be sure that Sheeta understood all that he attempted to communicate to him. That the man was tied and helpless Sheeta could, of course, see, but that to the mind of the panther this would carry any suggestion of harm in so far as his master was concerned, Tarzan could not guess. What had brought the beast to him? The fact that he had come augured well for what he might accomplish. But when Tarzan tried to get Sheeta to gnaw his bonds asunder, the great animal could not seem to understand what was expected of him, and instead but licked the wrist and arms of the prisoner. Presently there came an interruption. Someone was approaching the hut. Sheeta gave a low growl and slunk into the blackness of a far corner. Evidently the visitor did not hear the warning sound, for almost immediately he entered the hut, a tall, naked, savage warrior. He came to Tarzan's side and pricked him with a spear. From the lips of the ape-man came a weird, uncanny sound, and in answer to it there leaped from the blackness of the hut's farthermost corner a bolt of fur-clad death. Full upon the breast of the painted savage the great beast struck, burying sharp talons in the black flesh, and sinking great yellow fangs in the ebon throat. There was a fearful scream of anguish and terror from the black, and mingled with it was the hideous challenge of the killing panther. Then came silence. Silence except for the rending of bloody flesh and the crunching of human bones between mighty jaws. The noise had brought sudden quiet to the village without. Then there came the sound of voices in consultation. High-pitched, fear-filled voices, and deep, low tones of authority as the chief spoke. Tarzan and the panther heard the approaching footsteps of many men, and then, to Tarzan's surprise, the great cat rose from across the body of its kill, and slunk noiselessly from the hut through the aperture through which it had entered. The man heard the soft scraping of the body as it passed over the top of the palisade, and then silence. From the opposite side of the hut he heard the savages approaching to investigate. He had little hope that Sheeta would return, for had the great cat intended to defend him against all comers, it would have remained by his side as it heard the approaching savages without. Tarzan knew how strange were the workings of the brains of the mighty carnivora of the jungle, how fiendishly fearless they might be in the face of certain death, and again how timid upon the slightest provocation. There was doubt in his mind that some note of the approaching blats vibrating with fear had struck an answering chord in the nervous system of the panther, sending him slinking through the jungle, his tail between his legs. The man shrugged. Well, what of it? He had expected to die, and, after all, what might Sheeta have done for him other than to maul a couple of his enemies before a rifle in the hands of one of the whites should have dispatched him? If the cat could have released him, ah, that would have resulted in a very different story. But it had proved beyond the understanding of Sheeta, and now the beast was gone, and Tarzan must definitely abandon hope. The natives were at the entrance to the hut now, peering fearfully into the dark interior. Two in advance held lighted torches in their left hands, and ready spears in their right. They held back timorously against those behind, who were pushing them forward. The shrieks of the panther's victim, mingled with those of the great cat, had wrought mightily upon their poor nerves and now the awful silence of the dark interior seemed even more terribly ominous than had the frightful screaming. Presently one of those who was being forced unwillingly within hit upon a happy scheme for learning first the precise nature of the danger which menaced him from the silent interior. With a quick movement he flung his lighted torch into the center of the hut. Instantly all was illuminated for a brief second before the burning brand was dashed out against the earth floor. There was the figure of the white prisoner, still securely bound as they had last seen him, and in the center of the hut another figure equally as motionless, its throat and breast horribly torn and mangled. 
The sight that met the eyes of the foremost savages inspired more terror within their superstitious breasts than would the presence of Sheeta, for they saw only the result of a ferocious attack upon one of their fellows. Not seeing the cause, their fear-ridden minds were free to attribute the ghastly work to supernatural causes, and with the thought they turned, screaming from the hut, bowling over those who stood directly behind them in the exuberance of their terror. For an hour Tarzan heard only the murmur of excited voices from the far end of the village. Evidently the savages were once more attempting to work up their flickering courage to a point that would permit them to make another invasion of the hut, for now and then came a savage yell, such as the warriors give to bolster up their bravery upon the field of battle. But in the end it was two of the whites who first entered, carrying torches and guns. Tarzan was not surprised to discover that neither of them was Rokoff. He would have wagered his soul that no power on earth could have tempted that great coward to face the unknown menace of the hut. When the natives saw that the white men were not attacked, they too crowded into the interior. Their voices hushed with terror as they looked upon the mutilated corpse of their comrade. The whites tried in vain to elicit an explanation from Tarzan, but to all their queries he but shook his head, a grim and knowing smile curving his lips. At last Rokoff came. His face grew very white as his eyes rested upon the bloody thing grinning up at him from the floor, the face set in a death mass of excruciating horror. Come, he said to the chief. Let us get to work and finish this demon, before he has an opportunity to repeat this thing upon more of your people. The chief gave orders that Tarzan should be lifted and carried to the stake, but it was several minutes before he could prevail upon any of his men to touch the prisoner. At last, however, four of the younger warriors dragged Tarzan roughly from the hut, and once outside the pall of terror seemed lifted from the savage hearts. A score of howling blacks pushed and buffeted the prisoner down the village street, and bound him to the post in the center of the circle of little fires and boiling cooking pots. When at last he was made fast and seemed quite helpless and beyond the faintest hope of succor, Rokoff's shriveled ward of courage swelled to its usual proportions when danger was not present. He stepped close to the ape-man, and, seizing a spear from the hands of one of the savages, was the first to prod the helpless victim. A little stream of blood trickled down the giant's smooth skin from the wound in his side, but no murmur of pain passed his lips. The smile of contempt upon his face seemed to infuriate the Russian. With a volley of oaths, he leaped at the helpless captive, beating him upon the face with his clenched fists and kicking him mercilessly about the legs. Then he raised the heavy spear to drive it through the mighty heart, and still Tarzan of the Apes smiled contemptuously upon him. Before Rokoff could drive the weapon home, the chief sprang upon him and dragged him away from his intended victim. "'Stop, white man,' he cried. Rob us of this prisoner, and our death dance, and you yourself may have to take his place. The threat proved most effective in keeping the Russian from further assaults upon the prisoner, though he continued to stand a little apart and hurl taunts at his enemy. He told Tarzan that he himself was going to eat the ape-man's heart. He enlarged upon the horrors of the future life of Tarzan's son, and intimated that his vengeance would reach as well to Jane Clayton. "'You think your wife's safe in England,' said Rokoff. "'Poor fool!' She is even now in the hands of one not even of decent birth, and far from the safety of London and the protection of her friends. I had not meant to tell you this until I could bring to you upon Jungle Island proof of her fate. Now that you are about to die the most unthinkably horrible death that it has given a white man to die, let this word of the plight of your wife add to the torments that you must suffer before the last savage spear thrust releases you from your torture. The dance had commenced now, and the yells of the circling warriors drowned Rokoff's further attempts to distress his victim. The leaping savages, the flickering firelight played upon their painted bodies, circled about the victim at the stake. To Tarzan's memory came a similar scene, when he had rescued Darnot from a like predicament at the last moment before the final spear thrust should have ended his suffering. Who was there now to rescue him? In all the world there was none able to save him from the torture and the death. The thought that these human fiends would devour him when the dance was done caused him not a single qualm of horror or disgust. It did not add to his sufferings as it would have to those of an ordinary white man, for all his life Tarzan had seen the beasts of the jungle devour the flesh of their kills. Had he himself not battled for the grisly forearm of a great ape at that long-gone dum-dum, when he had slain the fierce tublet and won his niche in the respect of the apes of Kerchak? The dancers were leaping more closely to him now. The spears were commencing to find his body in the first torturing pricks that prefaced the more serious thrust. It would not be long now. The ape man longed for the last savage lunge that would end his misery. And then, far out in the mazes of the weird jungle, rose a shrill scream. 
For an instant the dancers paused, and in the silence of the interval there rose from the lips of the fast-bound white man an answering shriek, more fearsome and more terrible than that of the jungle beast that had roused it. For several minutes the blacks hesitated. Then, at the urging of Rokoff and their chief, they leaped in to finish the dance and the victim, but ere ever another spear touched the brown hide, a tawny streak of green-eyed hate and ferocity bounded from the door of the hut in which Tarzan had been imprisoned, and Sheeta, the panther, stood snarling beside his master. For an instant the blacks and the whites stood transfixed with terror. Their eyes were riveted upon the bared fangs of the jungle cat. Only Tarzan of the apes saw what else there was emerging from the dark interior of the hut. End of Chapter 8 Nine of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 9 Chivalry or Villainy. From her cabin port upon the Kincaid, Jane Clayton had seen her husband row to the verdure clad shore of Jungle Island and then the ship once more proceeded upon its way. For several days she saw no one other than Sven Anderson, the Kincaid's taciturn and repellent cook. She asked them the name of the shore upon which her husband had been set. I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard, replied the Swede, and that was all that she could get out of him. She had come to the conclusion that he spoke no other English, and so she ceased to importune him for information. But never did she forget to greet him pleasantly, or to thank him for the hideous, nauseating meals he brought her. Three days from the spot where Tarzan had been marooned, the Kincaid came to anchor in the mouth of a great river, and presently Rokoff came to Jane Clayton's cabin. "'We have arrived, my dear,' he said with a sickening leer. "'I have come to offer you safety, liberty, and ease. My heart has been softened towards you in your suffering, and I would make amends as best I may. Your husband was a brute. You know that best who found him naked in his native jungle.' roaming wild with the savage beasts that were his fellows. Now I am a gentleman, not only born of noble blood, but raised gently as befits a man of quality. To you, dear Jane, I offer the love of a cultured man in association with one of culture and refinement, which you must have sorely missed in your relations with the poor ape that through your girlish infatuation you married so thoughtlessly. I love you, Jane. You have but to say the word, and no further sorrow shall afflict you. Even your baby shall be returned to you unharmed." Outside the door Sven Anderson paused with the noonday meal he had been carrying to Lady Greystoke. Upon the end of his long stringy neck his little head was cocked to one side. His close-set eyes were half-closed. His ears, so expressive was his old attitude of stealthy eavesdropping, seemed truly to be cocked forward. Even his long, yellow, straggly mustache appeared to assume a sly droop. As Rokoff closed his appeal, awaiting the reply he invited, the look of surprise upon Jane Clayton's face turned to one of disgust. She fairly shuddered in the fellow's face. "'I would not have been surprised, M. Rokoff,' she said, "'had you attempted to force me to submit to your evil desires, "'but that you should be so fatuous as to believe that I, "'wife of John Clayton, would come to you willingly, "'even to save my life, I should never have imagined. "'I have known you for a scoundrel, M. Rokoff, "'but until now I had not taken you for a fool.' Rokoff's eyes narrowed, and the red of mortification "'flushed out the pallor of his face. "'He took a step toward the girl, threateningly. We shall see who is the fool at last, he hissed. When I have broken you to my will and your plebeian Yankee stubbornness has cost you all that you hold dear, even the life of your baby, for by the bones of St. Peter I'll forego all that I had planned for the brat and cut its heart out before your very eyes. You'll learn what it means to insult Nicholas Rokoff. Jane Clayton turned wearily away. What is the use, she said, of expatiating upon the depths to which your vengeful nature can sink? You cannot move me either by threats or deeds. My baby cannot judge yet for himself, but I, his mother, can foresee that should it have been given him to survive to man's estate, he would willingly sacrifice his life for the honor of his mother. Love him as I do, I would not purchase his life at such a price. Did I, he would execrate my memory to the day of his death. Rokoff was now thoroughly angered because of his failure to reduce the girl to terror. He felt only hate for her but it had come to his diseased mind that if he could force her to accede to his demands, as the price of her life and her child's, the cup of his revenge would be filled to brimming when he could flaunt the wife of Lord Greystoke in the capitals of Europe as his mistress. 
Again he stepped closer to her. His evil face was convulsed with rage and desire. Like a wild beast he sprang upon her, and with his strong fingers at her throat forced her backward upon the berth. At the same instant the door of the cabin opened noisily. Rokoff leaped to his feet, and turning, faced the Swede cook. Into the fellow's usually foxy eyes had come an expression of utter stupidity. His lower jaw dropped in vacuous harmony. He busied himself in arranging Lady Greystoke's meal upon the tiny table at one side of her cabin. The Russian glared at him. "'What do you mean?' he cried. "'By entering here without permission. Get out!' The cook turned his watery blue eyes upon Rokoff and smiled vacuously. "'I think it blow pretty soon pretty hard,' he said, and then he began rearranging the few dishes upon the little table. "'Get out of here, or I'll throw you out, you miserable blockhead!' roared Rokoff, taking a threatening step toward the Swede. Anderson continued to smile foolishly in his direction, but one ham-like paw slid stealthily to the handle of the long, slim knife that protruded from the greasy cord supporting his soiled apron. Rokoff saw the move and stopped short in his advance. Then he turned towards Jane Clayton. "'I will give you until tomorrow,' he said, "'to reconsider your answer to my offer. All will be sent ashore upon one pretext or another except you and the child.' Paulvich and myself. Then, without interruption, you will be able to witness the death of the baby. He spoke in French that the cook might not understand the sinister portent of his words. When he had done, he banged out of the cabin without another look at the man who had interrupted him in his sorry work. When he had gone, Sven Anderson turned toward Lady Greystoke. The idiotic expression that had masked his thoughts had fallen away, and in its place was one of craft and cunning. Hey, tank, I been a fool, he said. Hey, been the fool. I savvy French. Jane Clayton looked at him in surprise. You understand all that he said, then? Anderson grinned. You bet, he said. And you heard what was going on in here and came to protect me? You bang good to me, explained the Swede. Hey, treat me like dirty dog. I help you, lady. You yes wait. I help you. I been vas coast lots times. But how can you help me, Sven, she asked, when all these men will be against us? I tank, said Sven Anderson. It blow pretty soon pretty hard. And then he turned and left the cabin. Though Jane Clayton doubted the cook's ability to be of any material service to her, she was nevertheless deeply grateful to him for what he had already done. The feeling that among these enemies she had one friend brought the first ray of comfort that had come to lighten the burden of her miserable apprehensions throughout the long voyage of the Kincaid. She saw no more of Rokoff that day, nor of any other until Sven came with her evening meal. She tried to draw him in the conversation relative to his plans to aid her, but all she could get from him was his stereotype prophecy as to the future state of the wind. He seemed suddenly to have relapsed into his wanted state of dense stupidity. However, when he was leaving the cabin a little later with the empty dishes, he whispered very low, Leave on your clothes and roll up your blankets. I come back after you pretty soon. He would have slipped from the room at once, but Jane laid her hand upon his sleeve. My baby, she asked, I cannot go without him. You do what I tell you, said Anderson, scowling. I've been helping you, so don't you get too funny. When he had gone, Jane Clayton sank down upon her berth in utter bewilderment. What was she to do? Suspicions as to the intentions of the Swede swarmed her brain. Might she not be infinitely worse off if she gave herself into his power than she already was? No, she could be no worse off in company with the devil himself than with Nicholas Rokoff. For the devil, at least, bore the reputation of being a gentleman. She swore a dozen times that she would not leave the Kincaid without her baby, and yet she remained clothed long past her usual hour for retiring, and her blankets were neatly rolled and bound with stout cord, when, about midnight, there came a stealthy scratching upon the panels of her door. Swiftly she crossed the room and drew the bolt. Softly the door swung open to admit the muffled figure of the Swede. On one arm he carried a bundle, evidently his blankets. His other hand was raised in a gesture commanding silence, a grimy forefinger upon his lips. He came quite close to her. Carry this, he said. Do not make some noise when you see it, it being your kid. Quick hand snatched the bundle from the cook, and hungry mother arms folded the sleeping infant to her breast, while hot tears of joy ran down her cheeks, and her whole frame shook with the emotion of the moment. Come, said Anderson. We got no time to waste. He snatched up her bundle of blankets, and outside the cabin door his own as well. Then he led her to the ship's side, steadied her descent of the monkey ladder, holding the child for her as she climbed into the waiting boat below. A moment later, he had cut the rope that held the small boat to the steamer's side, and, bending silently to the muffled oars, 
was pulling toward the black shadows up the Ungambi River. Anderson rode on as though quite sure of his ground, and when after half an hour the moon broke through the clouds, there was revealed upon their left the mouth of a tributary running into the Ungambi. Up this narrow channel the Swede turned the prow of the small boat. Jane Clayton wondered if the man knew where he was bound. She did not know that in his capacity as cook he had that day been rowed up this very stream to a little village where he had bartered with the natives for such provisions as they had for sale, and that he had there arranged the details of his plan for the adventure upon which they were now setting forth. Even though the moon was full, the surface of the small river was quite dark. The giant trees overhung its narrow banks, meeting in a great arch above the center of the river. Spanish moss dropped from the gracefully bending limbs, and enormous creepers clambered in riotous profusion from the ground to the loftiest branch, falling in curving loops almost to the water's placid breast. Now and then the river's surface would be suddenly broken ahead of them by a huge crocodile, startled by the splashing of the oars. Or, snorting and blowing, a family of hippos would dive from a sandy bar to the cool, safe depths of the bottom. From the dense jungles upon either side came the weird night cries of the carnivora, the maniacal voice of the hyena, the coughing grunt of the panther, the deep and awful roar of the lion, and with them strange, uncanny notes that the girl could not ascribe to any particular night prowler, more terrible because of their mystery. Huddled in the stern of the boat, she sat with her baby strained close to her bosom, and because of that little, tender, helpless thing, she was happier tonight than she had been for many a sorrow-ridden day. Even though she knew not to what fate she was going, or how soon that fate might overtake her, still she was happy and thankful for the moment, however brief, that she might press her baby tightly in her arms. She could scarce wait for the coming of the day, that she might look again upon the bright face of her little black-eyed Jack. Again and again she tried to strain her eyes through the blackness of the jungle night to have but a tiny peep at those beloved features. But only the dim outline of the baby face rewarded her efforts. Then once more she would cuddle the warm little bundle close to her throbbing heart. It must have been close to three o'clock in the morning that Anderson brought the boat's nose to shore before a clearing where it could be dimly seen in the waning moonlight a cluster of native huts encircled by a thorn boma. At the village gate they were admitted by a native woman, the wife of the chief whom Anderson had paid to assist him. She took them to the chief's hut, but Anderson said that they would sleep without upon the ground, and so, her duty having been completed, she left them to their own devices. The Swede, after explaining in his gruff way that the huts were doubtless filthy and vermin-ridden, spread Jane's blankets on the ground for her, and at a little distance unrolled his own and lay down to sleep. It was some time before the girl could find a comfortable position upon the hard ground, but at last, the baby in the hollow of her arm, she dropped asleep from utter exhaustion. When she awoke it was broad daylight. About her were clustered a score of curious natives, mostly men. For among the aborigines it is the male who owns this characteristic in its most exaggerated form. Instinctively, Jane Clayton drew the baby more closely to her, though she soon saw that the blacks were far from intending her or the child any harm. In fact, one of them offered her a gourd of milk, a filthy, smoke-begrimed gourd with the ancient rind of long, curdled milk caked in layers within its neck. But the spirit of the giver touched her deeply, and her face lighted for a moment with one of those almost forgotten smiles of radiance that had helped to make her beauty famous both in Baltimore and London. She took the gourd in one hand, and rather than cause the giver pain, raised it to her lips, though for the life of her she could scarce restrain the qualm of nausea that surged through her as the malodorous thing approached her nostrils. It was Anderson who came to her rescue, and, taking the gourd from her, drank a portion himself, and then returned it to the native with a gift of blue beads. The sun was shining brightly now, and though the baby still slept, Jane could scarce restrain her impatient desire to have at least a brief glance at the beloved face. The natives had withdrawn at a command from their chief, who now stood talking with Anderson, a little apart from her. As she debated the wisdom of risking disturbing the child's slumber by lifting the blanket that now protected its face from the sun, she noted that the cook conversed with the chief in the language of the negro. What a remarkable man the fellow was indeed! She had thought him ignorant and stupid but a short day before, and now, within the past twenty-four hours, she had learned that he spoke not only English but French as well, and the primitive dialect of the West Coast. She had thought him shifty, cruel, and untrustworthy, yet in so far as she had reason to believe, he had proved himself in every way the contrary since the day before. It scarce seemed credible that he could be serving her from motives purely chivalrous. There must be something deeper in his intentions and plans than he had yet disclosed. 
She wondered, and when she looked at him, at his close-set, shifty eyes and repulsive features, she shuddered, for she was convinced that no lofty characteristics could be hid behind so foul an exterior. As she was thinking of these things, the while she debated the wisdom of uncovering the baby's face, there came a little grunt from the wee bundle in her lap, and then a gurgling coo that set her heart in raptures. The baby was awake. Now she might feast her eyes upon him. Quickly she snatched the blanket from before the infant's face. Anderson was looking at her as she did so. He saw her stagger to her feet, holding the baby at arm's length from her, her eyes glued in horror upon the little chubby face and twinkling eyes. Then he heard her piteous cry as her knees gave beneath her, and she sank to the ground in a swoon. End of chapter 9《Chapter Ten of the Beast of Tarzan》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. — The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. — Chapter Ten. — The Swede. As the warriors, clustered thick about Tarzan and Sheeta, realized that it was a flesh-and-blood panther that had interrupted their dance of death, they took heart a trifle for in the face of all those circling spears even the mighty Sheeta would be doomed. Rokoff was urging the chief to have his spearmen launch their missiles, and the black was upon the instant of issuing the command when his eyes strayed beyond Tarzan, following the gaze of the ape-man. With a yell of terror the chief turned and fled towards the village gate, and as his people looked to see the cause of his fright, they too took to their heels, for there, lumbering down upon them, their huge forms exaggerated by the play of moonlight and campfire, came the hideous apes of a cut. The instant the natives turned to flee, the ape-man's savage cry rang out above the shrieks of the blacks, and in answer to it, Sheeta and the apes leaped growling after the fugitives. Some of the warriors turned to battle with their enraged antagonists, but before the fiendish ferocity of the fierce beast they went down to bloody death. Others were dragged down in their flight, and it was not until the village was empty and the last of the blacks had disappeared into the bush that Tarzan was able to recall his savage pack to his side. Then it was that he discovered to his chagrin that he could not make one of them, not even the comparatively intelligent Akut, understand that he wished to be freed from the bonds that held him to the stake. In time, of course, the idea would filter through their thick skulls, but in the meanwhile many things might happen. The blacks might return in force to regain their village. The whites might readily pick them all off with their rifles from the surrounding trees. He might even starve to death before the dull-witted apes realized that he wished them to gnaw through his bonds. As for Sheeta, the great cat understood even less than the apes, but yet Tarzan could not but marvel at the remarkable characteristics this beast had evidenced. That it felt real affection for him there seemed little doubt, for now that the blacks were disposed of it walked slowly back and forth about the stake, rubbing its sides against the ape-man's legs, and purring like a contented tabby. That it had gone of its own volition to bring the balance of the pack to his rescue, Tarzan could not doubt. His Sheeta was indeed a jewel among beasts. Mungambi's absence worried the ape-man not a little. He attempted to learn from Akut what had become of the black. Fearing that the beast, freed from the restraint of Tarzan's present, might have fallen upon the man and devoured him, but to all his questions the great ape but pointed back in the direction from which they had come out of the jungle. The night passed with Tarzan still fast bound to the stake, and shortly after dawn his fears were realized in the discovery of naked black figures moving stealthily just within the edge of the jungle about the village. The blacks were returning. With daylight, their courage would be equal to the demands of a charge upon the handful of beasts that had routed them from their rightful abodes. The result of the encounter seemed foregone if the savages could curb their superstitious terror, for against their overwhelming numbers, their long spears and poisoned arrows, the panther and the apes could not be expected to survive a really determined attack. That the blacks were preparing for a charge became apparent a few moments later, when they commenced to show themselves in force upon the edge of the clearing dancing and jumping about as they waved their spears and shouted taunts and fierce war cries toward the village. These maneuvers, Tarzan knew, would continue until the blacks had worked themselves into a state of hysterical courage sufficient to sustain them for a short charge toward the village. And even though he doubted that they would reach it at first attempt, he believed that at the second or the third they would swarm through the gateway, when the outcome could not be aught than the extermination of Tarzan's bold but unarmed and undisciplined defenders. Even as he had guessed, the first charge carried the howling warriors but a short distance into the open, a shrill, weird challenge from the ape-man being all that was necessary to send them scurrying back to the bush. 
For half an hour they pranced and yelled their courage to the sticking point, and again essayed a charge. This time they came quite to the village gate, but when Sheeta and the hideous apes leaped among them, they turned screaming in terror, and again fled into the jungle. Again was the dancing and shouting repeated. This time Tarzan felt no doubt that they would enter the village and complete the work that a handful of determined white men would have carried to a successful conclusion at the first attempt. To have rescue come so close, only to be thwarted because he could not make his poor, savage friends understand precisely what he wanted of them was most irritating. But he could not find it in his heart to place blame upon them. They had done their best, and now he was sure they would doubtless remain to die with him in a fruitless effort to defend him. The blacks were already preparing for the charge. A few individuals had advanced a short distance toward the village, and were exhorting the others to follow them. In a moment the whole savage horde would be racing across the clearing. Tarzan thought only of the little child somewhere in this cruel, relentless wilderness. His heart ached for the son that he might no longer seek to save, and that the realization of Jane's suffering were all that weighed upon his brave spirit in these that he thought his last moments of life. Succor, all that he could hope for, had come to him in the instant of his extremity, and failed. There was nothing further for which to hope. The blacks were halfway across the clearing when Tarzan's attention was attracted by the actions of one of the apes. The beast was glaring toward one of the huts. Tarzan followed his gaze. To his infinite relief and delight he saw the stalwart form of Mungambi racing toward him. The huge black was panting heavily, as though from strenuous physical exertion and nervous excitement. He rushed to Tarzan's side, and as the first of the savages reached the village gate, the native's knife severed the last of the cords that bound Tarzan to the stake. In the street lay the corpses of the savages that had fallen before the pack the night before. From one of these Tarzan seized a spear and knobstick, and with Mugambi at his side and the snarling pack about him, he met the natives as they poured through the gate. Fierce and terrible was the battle that ensued, but at last the savages were routed, more by terror perhaps at sight of a black man and a white fighting in company with a panther and the huge fierce apes of a cut, than because of their inability to overcome the relatively small force that opposed them. One prisoner fell into the hands of Tarzan, and him the ape-man questioned in an effort to learn what had become of Rokoff and his party. Promised his liberty in return for the information, the black told all he knew concerning the movements of the Russian. It seemed that early in the morning their chief had attempted to prevail upon the whites to return with him to the village and with their guns destroy the ferocious pack that had taken possession of it. But Rokoff appeared to entertain even more fears of the giant white man and his savage companions than even the blacks themselves. Upon no conditions would he consent to returning even within sight of the village. Instead, he took his party hurriedly to the river, where they stole a number of canoes the blacks had hidden there. The last that they had seen of them, they had been paddling strongly upstream, their porters from Kaviri's village wielding the blades. So once more Tarzan of the Apes with his hideous pack took up his search for the ape-man's son and the pursuit of his abductor. For weary days they followed through an almost uninhabited country, only to learn at last that they were upon the wrong trail. The little band had been reduced by three, for three of Akut's apes had fallen in the fighting at the village. Now with Akut there were five great apes, and Sheeta was there, and Mungambi and Tarzan. The ape-man no longer heard rumors even of the three who had preceded Rokoff, the white man and the woman and the child. Who the man and woman were he could not guess, but that the child was his was enough to keep him hot upon the trail. He was sure that Rokoff would be following this trio and so he felt confident that so long as he could keep upon the Russian's trail, he would be winning so much nearer to the time he might snatch his son from the dangers and horrors that menaced him. In retracing their way after losing Rokoff's trail, Tarzan picked it up again at a point where the Russian had left the river and taken to the brush in a northerly direction. He could only account for this change on the ground that the child had been carried away from the river by the two who now had possession of it. Nowhere along the way, however, could he gain definite information that might assure him positively that the child was ahead of him. Not a single native they questioned had seen or heard of this other party, though nearly all had direct experience with the Russian or had talked with others who had. It was with difficulty that Tarzan could find means to communicate with the natives, as the moment their eyes fell upon his companions they fled precipitously into the bush. His only alternative was to go ahead of his pack and waylay an occasional warrior whom he found alone in the jungle. One day as he was thus engaged, Tracking an unsuspecting savage, he came upon the fellow in the act of hurling a spear at a wounded white man who crouched in a clump of bush at the trail's side. The white was one whom Tarzan had often seen, and whom he recognized at once. Deep in his memory was implanted those repulsive features, the close-set eyes, the shifty expression, 
the drooping yellow moustache. Instantly it occurred to the ape-man that this fellow had not been among those who had accompanied Rokoff at the village where Tarzan had been a prisoner. He had seen them all, and this fellow had not been there. There could be but one explanation. He it was who had fled ahead of the Russian with the woman and the child, and the woman had been Jane Clayton. He was sure now of the meaning of Rokoff's words. The ape-man's face went white as he looked upon the pasty, vice-marked countenance of the Swede. Across Tarzan's forehead stood out the broad band of scarlet that marked the scar where, years before, Turkaz had torn a great strip of the ape-man's scalp from his skull in the fierce battle in which Tarzan had sustained his fitness to the kingship of the apes of Kerchak. The man was his prey. The black should not have him, and with the thought he leaped upon the warrior, striking down the spear before it could reach its mark. The black, whipping out his knife, turned to do battle with this new enemy, while the Swede, lying in the bush, witnessed a duel the like of which he had never dreamed to see, a half-naked white man battling with a half-naked black, hand to hand with the crude weapons of primeval man at first, and then with hands and teeth like the primordial brutes from whose loins their forebears sprung. For a time Anderson did not recognize the white, and then at last it dawned upon him that he had seen this giant before. His eyes went wide in surprise that this growling, rending beast could ever have been the well-groomed English gentleman who had been a prisoner aboard the Kincaid. An English nobleman. He had learned the identity of the Kincaid's prisoners from Lady Greystoke during their flight up the Ungambi. Before, in common with the other members of the crew of the steamer, he had not known who the two might be. The fight was over. Tarzan had been compelled to kill his antagonist, as the fellow would not surrender. The Swede saw the white man leap to his feet beside the corpse of his foe, and placing one foot upon the broken neck, lift his voice in the hideous challenge of the victorious bull ape. Anderson shuddered. Then Tarzan turned toward him. His face was cold and cruel, and in the gray eyes the Swede read murder. "'Where is my wife?' growled the ape-man. "'Where is the child?' Anderson tried to reply, but a sudden fit of coughing choked him. There was an arrow entirely through his chest and as he coughed the blood from his wounded lung poured suddenly from his mouth and nostrils. Tarzan stood waiting for the paroxysm to pass. Like a bronze image, cold, hard, and relentless, he stood over the helpless man, waiting to wring such information from him as he needed, and then to kill. Presently the coughing and hemorrhaging ceased, and again the wounded man tried to speak. Tarzan knelt near the faintly moving lips. The wife and child, he repeated. Where are they? Anderson pointed up the trail. The Russian. He got them, he whispered. How did you come here? continued Tarzan. Why are you not with Rokoff? They catch us, replied Anderson, in a voice so low that the ape man could just distinguish the words. They catch us. I fight. But my men, they all run away. Then they get me when I been wounded. Rokoff say he leave me here for the hyenas. That was worse than to kill. He take your wife and kid. What were you doing with them? "'Where were you taking them?' asked Tarzan, and then, fiercely leaping close to the fellow with fierce eyes blazing with the passion of hate and vengeance that he had with difficulty controlled, "'What harm did you do to my wife or child? Speak quick before I kill you. Make your peace with God. Tell me the worst or I will tear you to pieces with my hands and teeth. You have seen that I can do it.' A look of wide-eyed surprise overspread Anderson's face. "'Why?' he whispered. "'I did not hurt them.' I tried to save them from that Russian. Your wife was kind to me on the Kincaid, and I hear that little baby cry sometimes. I got a wife and kid for my own by Christiana, and I couldn't bear for to see them separated and in Rokoff's hands any more. That was all. Do I look like I've been here to hurt them? He continued after a pause, pointing to the arrow protruding from his breast. There was something in the man's tone and expression that convinced Tarzan of the truth of his assertions. More weighty than anything else was the fact that Anderson evidently seemed more hurt than frightened. He knew he was going to die, so Tarzan's threats had little effect upon him. But it was quite apparent that he wished the Englishman to know the truth, and not to wrong him by harboring the belief that his words and manner indicated that he had entertained. The ape-man instantly dropped to his knees beside the Swede. "'I am sorry,' he said very simply. "'I had looked for none but knaves in company with Rokoff. I see that I was wrong.' That is past now, and we will drop it for the more important matter of getting you to a place of comfort and for looking after your wounds. We must have you on your feet again as soon as possible. Then the Swede, smiling, shook his head. You go on and look for the wife and kid, he said. I've been as good as dead already, but, he hesitated, 
I hate to think of the hyenas. Won't you finish up this job? Tarzan shuddered. A moment ago he had been upon the point of killing this man. Now he could no more have taken his life than he could have taken the life of any of his best friends. He lifted the Swede's head in his arms to change and ease his position. Again came a fit of coughing and the terrible hemorrhage. After it was over, Anderson lay with closed eyes. Tarzan thought that he was dead, until he suddenly raised his eyes to those of the ape-man, sighed, and spoke in a very low, weak whisper. "'I think it blow pretty soon, pretty hard,' he said, and died. End of chapter 10「Chapter Eleven of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Eleven Tembudza. Tarzan scooped a shallow grave for the Kincaid's cook, beneath whose repulsive exterior had beaten the heart of a chivalrous gentleman. That was all he could do in the cruel jungle for the man who had given his life in the service of his little son and his wife. Then Tarzan took up again the pursuit of Rokoff. Now that he was positive that the woman ahead of him was indeed Jane, and that she had again fallen into the hands of the Russian, it seemed that with all the incredible speed of his fleet and agile muscles he moved but at a snail's pace. It was with difficulty that he kept the trail, for there were many paths through the jungle at this point crossing and criss-crossing, forking and branching in all directions, and over them all had passed natives innumerable, coming and going. The spore of the white men was obliterated by that of the native carriers who had followed them, and over all was the spore of other natives, and of wild beasts. It was most perplexing, yet Tarzan kept on assiduously, checking his sense of sight against his sense of smell, that he might more surely keep to the right trail. But, with all his care, night found him at a point where he was positive that he was on the wrong trail entirely. He knew that the pack would follow his spore, and so he had been careful to make it as distinct as possible, brushing often against the vines and creepers that walled the jungle path, and in other ways leaving his scent spore plainly discernible. As darkness settled, a heavy rain set in, and there was nothing for the baffled ape man to do but wait in the partial shelter of a huge tree until morning, but the coming of dawn brought no cessation of the torrential downpour. For a week the sun was obscured by heavy clouds, while violent rain and windstorms obliterated the last remnants of the spore Tarzan constantly though vainly sought. During all this time he saw no signs of natives, nor of his own pack, the members of which he feared had lost his trail during the terrific storm. As the country was strange to him, he had been unable to judge his course accurately, since he had had neither sun by day, nor moon nor stars by night to guide him. When the sun at last broke through the clouds in the forenoon of the seventh day, it looked down upon an almost frantic ape-man. For the first time in his life Tarzan of the Apes had been lost in the jungle. That the experience should have befallen him at such a time seemed cruel beyond expression. Somewhere in this savage land his wife and son lay in the clutches of the arch-fiend Rokoff. What hideous trials might they not have undergone during those seven awful days that nature had thwarted him in his endeavors to locate them? Tarzan knew the Russian, in whose power they were, so well that he could not doubt but that the man, filled with rage that Jane had once escaped him, and knowing that Tarzan might be close upon his trail, would wreak without further loss of time whatever vengeance his polluted mind might be able to conceive. But, now that the sun shone once more, the ape-man was still at a loss as to what direction to take. He knew that Rokoff had left the river in pursuit of Anderson, but whether he would continue inland or return to the Ugambi was a question. The ape-man had seen that the river at the point he had left it was growing narrow and swift, so that he judged that it could not be navigable even for canoes to any great distance farther toward its source. However, if Rokoff had not returned to the river, in what direction had he proceeded? From the direction of Anderson's flight with Jane and the child, Tarzan was convinced that the man had purposed in tempting the treacherous feat of crossing the continent to Zanzibar. But whether Rokoff would dare so dangerous a journey or not was a question. Fear might drive him to the attempt now that he knew the manner of the horrible pack that was upon his trail, and that Tarzan of the Apes was following him to wreak upon him the vengeance that he deserved. At last the ape-man determined to continue toward the northeast in the general direction of German East Africa until he came upon natives from whom he might gain information as to Rokoff's whereabouts. The second day following the cessation of the rain, Tarzan came upon a native village the inhabitants of which fled into the bush the instant their eyes fell upon him. Tarzan, not to be thwarted in any such manner as this, pursued them, and after a brief chase caught up with a young warrior. 
the fellow was so badly frightened that he was unable to defend himself, dropping his weapons and falling upon the ground, wide-eyed and screaming as he gazed on his captor. It was with considerable difficulty that the ape-man quieted the fellow's fears sufficiently to obtain a coherent statement from him as to the cause of his uncalled-for terror. From him Tarzan learned, by dint of much coaxing, that a party of whites had passed through the village several days before. These men had told him of a terrible white devil that pursued them, warning the natives against it and the frightful pack of demons that accompanied it. The black had recognized Tarzan as the white devil from the description given by the whites and their black servants. Behind him he had expected to see a horde of demons disguised as apes and panthers. In this Tarzan saw the cunning hand of Rokoff. The Russian was attempting to make travel as difficult as possible for him by turning the natives against him in superstitious fear. The native further told Tarzan that the white man who had led the recent expedition had promised them a fabulous reward if they would kill the white devil. This they had fully intended doing should the opportunity present itself, but the moment they had seen Tarzan their blood had turned to water, as the porters of the white man had told them would be the case. Finding the ape-man had no attempt to harm him, the native at last recovered his grasp upon his courage, and, at Tarzan's suggestion, accompanied the white devil back to the village, calling as he went for his fellows to return also, as, The white devil has promised to do you no harm if you come back right away and answer his questions. One by one the blacks straggled into the village, but that their fears were not entirely allayed was evident from the amount of white that showed about the eyes of the majority of them, as they cast constant and apprehensive sidelong glances at the ape-man. The chief was among the first to return to the village, and as it was he that Tarzan was most anxious to interview, he lost no time in entering into a palaver with the black. The fellow was short and stout, with an unusually low and degraded countenance and ape-like arms. His whole expression denoted deceitfulness. Only the superstitious terror engendered in him by the stories poured into his ears by the whites and blacks of the Russian's party kept him from leaping upon Tarzan with his warriors and slaying him forthwith, for he and his people were inveterate man-eaters. But the fear that he might indeed be a devil, and that out there in the jungle behind him his fierce demons waited to do his biddings, kept Maganwazam from putting his desires into action. Tarzan questioned the fellow closely, and by comparing his statements with those of the young warrior he had first talked with, he learned that Rokoff and his safari were in terror-stricken retreat in the direction of the far east coast. Many of the Russian's porters had already deserted him. In that very village he had hanged five for theft and attempted desertion. Judging, however, from what the Waganwazam had learned from those of the Russian's blacks who were not too far gone in terror of the brutal Rokoff to fear even to speak of their plans, it was apparent that he would not travel any great distance before the last of his porters, cooks, tent-boys, gun-bearers, Ascari, and even his headmen, would have turned back into the bush, leaving him to the mercy of the merciless jungle. Maganwazam denied that there had been any white woman or child with the party of whites, but even as he spoke Tarzan was convinced that he lied. Several times the ape-man approached the subject from different angles, but never was he successful in surprising the wily cannibal into a direct contradiction of his original statement that there had been no woman or children with the party. Tarzan demanded food of the chief, and after considerable haggling on the part of the monarch, succeeded in obtaining a meal. He then tried to draw at others of the tribe, especially the young man whom he had captured in the bush, but Maganwazam's presence sealed their lips. At last, convinced that these people knew a great deal more than they had told him concerning the whereabouts of the Russian and the fate of Jane and the child, Tarzan determined to remain overnight among them in hopes of discovering something further of importance. When he had stated his decision to the chief, he was rather surprised to note the sudden change in the fellow's attitude toward him. From apparent dislike and suspicion, Maganwazam became a most eager and solicitous host. Nothing would do but that the ape-man should occupy the best hut in the village, from which Maganwazam's oldest wife was forthwith summarily ejected, while the chief took up his temporary abode in the hut of one of his younger consorts. Had Charzan chanced to recall the fact that a princely reward had been offered the blacks if they should succeed in killing him, he might have more quickly interpreted Maganwazam's sudden change in front. To have the white giant sleeping peacefully in one of his own huts would greatly facilitate the matter of earning the reward, and so the chief was urgent in his suggestions that Tarzan, doubtless being very much fatigued after his travels, should retire early to the comforts of anything but inviting palace. As much as the ape-man detested the thought of sleeping within a native hut, he had determined to do so this night, on the chance that he might be able to induce one of the younger men to sit and chat with him before the fire that burned in the center of the smoke-filled dwelling, and from him draw the truce he sought. 
So Tarzan accepted the invitation of old M'ganwazam, insisting, however, that he much preferred sharing a hut with some of the younger men rather than driving the chief's old wife out in the cold. The toothless old hag grinned her appreciation of this suggestion, and, as the plan still better suited the chief's scheme, in that it would permit him to surround Tarzan with a gang of picked assassins, he readily assented, so that presently Tarzan had been installed in a hut close to the village gate. As there was to be a dance that night in honor of a band of recently returned hunters, Tarzan was left alone in the hut, the young men, as M'ganwazam explained, having to take part in the festivities. As soon as the ape-man was safely installed in the trap, M'ganwazam called about him the young warriors whom he had selected to spend the night with the white devil. None of them was overly enthusiastic about the plan, since deep in their superstitious hearts lay an exaggerated fear of the strange white giant. But the word of M'ganwazam was law among his people, so not one dared to refuse the duty he was called upon to perform. As M'ganwazam unfolded his plan in whispers to the savages squatting about him, the old toothless hag to whom Tarzan had saved her hut for the night hovered about the conspirators, ostensibly to replenish the supply of firewood for the blaze about which the men sat, but really to drink in as much of their conversation as possible. Tarzan had slept for perhaps an hour or two despite the savage din of the revelers when his keen senses came suddenly alert to a suspicious stealthy movement in the hut in which he lay. The fire had died down to a heap of glowing embers, which accentuated rather than relieved the darkness that shrouded the interior of the evil-smelling dwelling. Yet the trained senses of the ape-man warned him of another presence creeping almost silently toward him through the gloom. He doubted that it was one of his hutmates returning from the festivities, for he still heard the wild cries of the dancers and the din of the tom-toms in the village street without. Who could it be that took such pains to conceal his approach? As the presence came within reach of him, the ape-man bounded lightly to the opposite side of the hut, his spear poised ready at his side. "'Who is it?' he asked, "'that creeps upon Tarzan of the apes like a hungry lion out of the darkness?' "'Silence, Buana," replied an old crackle voice. "'It is Tambudza, she whose hut you would not take, and thus drive an old woman out into the cold night.' "'What does Tambudza want of Tarzan of the apes?' asked the ape-man. "'You were kind to me,' to whom none is now kind. And I have come to warn you in payment of your kindness, answered the old hag. Warn me of what? M'ganwazam has chosen the young men who are to sleep in the hut with you, replied Tambudza. I was near as he talked with them, and heard him issuing his instructions to them. When the dances run well into the morning, they are to come to the hut. If you are awake, they are to pretend that they have come to sleep. But if you sleep, it is M'ganwazam's command that you be killed." If you are not then asleep, they will wait quietly beside you until you do sleep, and then they will fall upon you together and slay you. M'ganwazam is determined to win the reward the white man has offered. I had forgotten the reward, said Tarzan half to himself, and then he added, How may M'ganwazam hope to collect the reward now that the white men who are my enemies have left his country, and gone he knows not where? Oh, they have not gone far, replied Tambudza. M'ganwazam knows where they camp. His runners could quickly overtake them. They move slowly. "'Where are they?' asked Tarzan. "'Do you wish to come to them?' asked Tambudza in way of reply. Tarzan nodded. "'I cannot tell you where they lie so that you could come to the place yourself, but I could lead you to them, Buana. In their interest in the conversation, neither of the speakers had noticed a little figure which crept into the darkness of the hut behind them, nor did they see it when it slunk noiselessly out again. It was little Bualu, the chief's son by one of his younger wives, a vindictive, degenerate little rascal who hated Tambudza, and was ever seeking opportunities to spy upon her and report her slightest breach of custom to his father. "'Come, then,' said Tarzan quickly. "'Let us be on our way.' This Buleu did not hear, for he was already legging it up the village street to where his hideous sire guzzled native beer, and watching the evolutions of the frantic dancers leaping high in the air and cavorting wildly in their hysterical capers. So it happened that as Tarzan and Tembudza sneaked warily from the village and melted into the Stygian darkness of the jungle, two lithe runners took their way in the same direction, though by another trail. When they had come sufficiently far from the village to make it safe for them to speak above a whisper, Tarzan asked the old woman if she had seen aught of a white woman and a little child. "'Yes, Buana," replied Tembudza. "'There was a woman with them and a little child, a little white piccaninny. It died here in our village of the fever, and they buried it. End of chapter 11
Love of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 12 A Black Scoundrel. When Jane Clayton regained consciousness, she saw Anderson standing over her, holding the baby in his arms. As her eyes rested upon them, an expression of misery and horror overspread her countenance. "'What is the matter?' he asked. "'You bane sick?' "'Where is my baby?' she cried, ignoring his questions. Anderson held out the chubby infant, but she shook her head. "'It is not mine,' she said. "'You knew that it was not mine. You are a devil, like the Russian.' Anderson's blue eyes stretched in surprise. "'Not yours,' he exclaimed. "'You told me the kid aboard the Kincaid bane your kid.' "'Not this one,' replied Jane dully. "'The other. Where is the other? There must have been two. I did not know about this one.' "'There wasn't no other kid. I tank this being yours. I am very sorry.' Anderson fidgeted about, standing first on one foot and then upon the other. It was perfectly evident to Jane that he was honest in his protestations of ignorance of the true identity of the child. Presently the baby commenced to crow, and bounce up and down in the Swede's arms and at the same time leaning forward with little hands outreaching toward the young woman. She could not withstand the appeal, and with a low cry she sprang to her feet and gathered the baby to her breast. For a few minutes she wept silently, her face buried in the baby's soiled little dress. The first shock of disappointment that the tiny thing had not been her beloved Jack was giving away to a great hope that after all some miracle had occurred to snatch her baby from Rokoff's hands at the last instant before the Kincaid sailed from England. Then, too, there was the mute appeal of this wee waif alone and unloved in the midst of the horrors of the savage jungle. It was this thought, more than any other, that had sent her mother's heart out to the innocent babe, while still she suffered from disappointment that she had been deceived in its identity. "'Have you no idea whose child this is?' she asked Anderson. The man shook his head. "'Not now,' he said. "'If he ain't bane your kid, I don't know whose kid he bane. Rokoff said it was yours. I tank he tank so, too.' What can we do with it now? I can't go back to the Kincaid. Rokoff would have me shot, but you can go back. I take you to the sea, and then some of these black men, they take you to the ship, eh? No, no, cried Jane, not for the world. I would rather die than fall into the hands of that man again. No, let us go on and take this poor creature with us. If God is willing, we shall be saved in one way or another. So they again took up their flight through the wilderness taking with them a half-dozen of the masalas to carry provisions, and the tents that Anderson had smuggled aboard the small boat in preparation for the attempted escape. The days and nights of torture that the young woman suffered were so merged into one long, unbroken nightmare of hideousness that she soon lost all track of time. Whether they had been wandering for days or years she could not tell. The one bright spot in that eternity of fear and suffering was a little child whose tiny hands had long since fastened their softly groping fingers firmly about her heart. In a way, the little thing took the place and filled the aching void that the theft of her own baby had left. It could never be the same, of course, but yet, day by day, she found her mother love enveloping the waif more closely, until sometimes she sat with closed eyes lost in the sweet imagining that the little bundle of humanity at her breast was truly her own. For some time their progress inland was extremely slow. Word came to them from time to time through natives passing from the coast on hunting excursions that Rokoff had not yet guessed the direction of their flight. This, and the desire to make the journey as light as possible for the gently bred woman, kept Anderson to a slow advance of short and easy marches with many rest. The Swede insisted upon carrying the child while they traveled, and in countless other ways did what he could to help Jane Clayton conserve her strength. He had been terribly chagrined on discovering the mistake he had made in the identity of the baby, but once the young woman became convinced that his motives were truly chivalrous, she would not permit him any longer to upbraid himself for the error that he could not by any means have avoided. At the close of each day's march, Anderson saw to the erection of a comfortable shelter for Jane and the child. Her tent was always pitched in the most favorable location. The thorn boom around it was the strongest and most impregnable that the Mosula could construct. Her food was the best that their limited stores and the rifle of the Swede could provide. But the thing that touched her heart the closest was the gentle consideration and courtesy which the man always accorded her. That such nobility of character could lie beneath so repulsive an exterior never ceased to be a source of wonder and amazement to her, until at last the innate chivalry of the man 
and his unfailing kindness and sympathy transformed his appearance in so far as Jane was concerned, until she saw only the sweetness of his character mirrored in his countenance. They had commenced to make a little better progress when word reached them that Rokoff was but a few marches behind them, and that he had at last discovered the direction of their flight. It was then that Anderson took to the river, purchasing a canoe from a chief whose village lay a short distance from the Ungambi upon the bank of a tributary. Thereafter the little party of fugitives fled up the broad Ungambi, and so rapid had their flight become that they no longer received word of their pursuers. At the end of canoe navigation upon the river they abandoned their canoe and took to the jungle. Here progress became at once arduous, slow, and dangerous. The second day after leaving the Ugambi, the baby fell ill with fever. Anderson knew what the outcome must be, but he had not the heart to tell Jane Clayton the truth, for he had seen that the young woman had come to love the child almost as passionately as though it had been her own flesh and blood. As the baby's condition precluded farther advance, Anderson withdrew a little from the main trail he had been following and built a camp in a natural clearing on the bank of a little river. Here Jane devoted her every moment to caring for the tiny sufferer, as though her sorrow and anxiety were not all that she could bear. A further blow came with the sudden announcement of one of the Masula porters, who had been foraging in the jungle adjacent that Rokoff and his party were camped quite close to them, and were evidently upon their trail to this little nook, which all had thought so excellent a hiding place. This information could mean but one thing, and that they must break camp and fly onward regardless of the baby's condition. Jane Clayton knew the traits of the Russian well enough to be positive that he would separate her from the child the moment that he recaptured them, and she knew that separation would mean the immediate death of the baby. As they stumbled forward through the tangled vegetation along an old and almost overgrown game trail, the Masula porters deserted them one by one. The men had been staunch enough in their devotion and loyalty as long as they were in no danger of being overtaken by the Russian and his party. They had heard, however, so much of the atrocious disposition of Rokoff that they had grown to hold him in mortal terror, and now that they knew he was close upon them, their timid hearts would fortify them no longer, and as quickly as possible they deserted the three whites. Yet on and on went Anderson and the girl. The Swede went ahead, to hew a way through the brush where the path was entirely overgrown, so that on this march it was necessary that the young woman carry the child. All day they marched. Late in the afternoon they realized that they had failed. Close behind them they heard the noise of a large safari advancing along the trail, which they had cleared for their pursuers. When it became quite evident that they must be overtaken in a short time, Anderson hid Jane behind a large tree, covering her and the child with brush. "'There is a village about a mile further on,' he said to her. "'The Masula told me its location before they deserted us. "'I try to lead the Russian off your trail. Then you go on to the village. "'I think the chief been friendly to white men. The Masula tell me he had been.' Anyhow, that was all we can do. After a while, you get chief to take you down by the Musula village to the sea again, and after a while, a ship is sure to pit into the mouth of the Ungambi. Then you be all right. Good-bye and good luck to you, lady. But where are you going, Sven? asked Jane. Why can't you hide here and go back to the sea with me? I gotta tell the Russian you been dead, so that he don't look for you no more, and Anderson grinned. Why can't you join me then after you have told him that? insisted the girl. Anderson shook his head. "'I don't think I join anybody any more after I tell the Russian you being dead,' he said. "'You don't mean that you think he will kill you?' asked Jane. And yet in her heart she knew that that was exactly what the great scoundrel would do in revenge for his having been thwarted by the Swede. Anderson did not reply, other than to warn her to silence and point toward the path along which they had just come. "'I don't care,' whispered Jane Clayton. "'I shall not let you die to save me if I can prevent it in any way.' Give me your revolver. I can use that, and together we may be able to hold them off until we can find some means of escape. It won't work, lady, replied Anderson. They would only get us both, and then I couldn't do you no good at all. Think of the kid, lady, and what it would be for you both to fall into Rokoff's hands again. For his sake you must do what I say. Here, take my rifle and ammunition. You may need them. He shoved the gun and bandolier into the shelter beside Jane. Then he was gone. She watched him as he returned along the path to meet the oncoming safari of the Russian. Soon a turn in the trail hid him from view. Her first impulse was to follow. With the rifle she might be of assistance to him, and further she could not bear the terrible thought of being left alone at the mercy of the fearful jungle without a single friend to aid her. She started to crawl from her shelter with the intention of running after Anderson as fast as she could, 
As she drew the baby close to her, she glanced down into its little face. How red it was! How unnatural the little thing looked! She raised the cheek to hers. It was fiery hot with fever. With a little gasp of terror, Jane Clayton rose to her feet in the jungle path. The rifle and bandolier lay forgotten in the shelter beside her. Anderson was forgotten, and Rokoff, and her great peril. All that rioted through her fear-mad brain was the fearful fact that this little helpless child was stricken with a terrible jungle fever, and that she was helpless to do aught to allay its sufferings, sufferings that were sure to come during ensuing intervals of partial consciousness. Her one thought was to find someone who could help her, some woman who had had children of her own, and with the thought came recollection of the friendly village of which Anderson had spoken. If she could but reach it, in time. There was no time to be lost. Like a startled antelope, she turned and fled up the trail in the direction Anderson had indicated. From far behind came the sudden shouting of men, the sound of shots, and then silence. She knew that Anderson had met the Russian. A half hour later she stumbled, exhausted, into a little thatched village. Instantly she was surrounded by men, women, and children. Eager, curious, excited natives plied her with a hundred questions, no one of which she could understand or answer. All that she could do was point tearfully at the baby, now wailing piteously in her arms, and repeat over and over, Fever, fever, fever. The blacks did not understand her words, but they saw the cause of her trouble. And soon a young woman had pulled her into a hut, and with several others was doing her poor best to quiet the child and allay its agony. The witch doctor came in and built a little fire before the infant, upon which he boiled some strange concoction in a small earthen pot making weird passes above it and mumbling strange, monotonous chants. Presently he dipped the zebra's tail into the brew, and with further mutterings and incantations sprinkled a few drops of the liquid over the baby's face. After he had gone, the women sat about and moaned and wailed until Jane thought that she should go mad. But, knowing that they were doing it all out of the kindness of their hearts, she endured the frightful waking nightmare of those awful hours in dumb and patient suffering. It must have been well toward midnight that she became conscious of a sudden commotion in the village. She heard the voices of the natives raised in controversy, but she could not understand the words. Presently she heard footsteps approaching the hut in which she squatted before a bright fire, with the baby on her lap. The little thing lay very still now, its lids half raised, showed the pupils horribly upturned. Jane Clayton looked into the little face with fear-haunted eyes. It was not her baby, not her flesh and blood. But how close, how dear the tiny helpless thing had become to her. Her heart, bereft of its own, had gone out to this poor little nameless waif, and lavished upon it all the love that had been denied her during the long bitter weeks of her captivity aboard the Kincaid. She saw that the end was near, and though she was terrified at contemplation of her loss, still she hoped that it would come quickly now, and in the suffering of the little victim. The footsteps she had heard without the hut now halted before the door. There was a whispered colloquy and a moment later Maganwazam, chief of the tribe, entered. She had seen but little of him, as the women had taken her in hand almost as soon as she entered the village. Maganwazam, she now saw, was an evil-appearing savage, with every mark of brutal degeneracy writ large upon his bestial countenance. To Jane Clayton he looked more gorilla than human. He tried to converse with her, but without success, and finally he called to someone without. In answer to his summons another negro entered, a man of a very different appearance from Maganwazam, so different, in fact, that Jane Clayton immediately decided that he was of another tribe. The man acted as interpreter, and almost from the first question that Maganwazam put to her, Jane felt an intuitive conviction that the savage was attempting to draw information from her for some ulterior motive. She thought it strange that the fellow should so suddenly have become interested in her plans, and especially in her intended destination when her journey had been interrupted at his village. Seeing no reason for withholding the information, she told him the truth. But when he asked if she expected to meet her husband at the end of the trip, she shook her head negatively. Then he told her the purpose of his visit, talking through the interpreter. I have just learned, he said, from some men who live by the side of the great water, that your husband followed you up the Ungambi for several marches, when he was at last set upon by natives and killed. Therefore I have told you this, that you might not waste your time in a long journey if you expected to meet your husband at the end of it, but instead could turn and retrace your steps to the coast. Jane thanked Maganwazam for his kindness, though her heart was numb with suffering at this new blow. She who had suffered so much was at last beyond reach of the keenest of misery's pangs, 
for her senses were numbed and calloused. With bowed head she sat staring with unseen eyes upon the face of the baby in her lap. Maganwazam had left the hut. Some time later she heard a noise at the entrance. Another had entered. One of the women, sitting opposite her, threw a faggot upon the dying embers of the fire between them. With a sudden flare it burst into renewed flame, lighting up the hut's interior as though by magic. The flame disclosed to Jane Clayton's horrified gaze that the baby was quite dead. How long it had been so, she could not guess. A choking lump rose to her throat, her head dropped in silent misery upon the little bundle that she had caught suddenly to her breast. For a moment the silence of the hut was unbroken. Then the native woman broke into a hideous wail. A man coughed close before Jane Clayton and spoke her name. With a start she raised her eyes to look into the sardonic countenance of Nicholas Rokoff. End of chapter 12《of the Beast of Tarzan》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher.《The Beast of Tarzan》by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 13 Escape. For a moment, Rokoff stood sneering down upon Jane Clayton. Then his eyes fell to the little bundle in her lap. Jane had drawn one corner of the blanket over the child's face, so that to one who did not know the truth it seemed to be but sleeping. "'You have gone to a great deal of unnecessary trouble,' said Rokoff, "'to bring the child to this village. "'If you had attended to your own affairs, I should have brought it here myself. "'You would have been spared the dangers and fatigue of the journey, "'but I suppose I must thank you for relieving me of the inconvenience "'of having to care for a young infant on the march.' This is the village to which the child was destined from the first. Maganwazam will rear him carefully, making a good cannibal of him, and if you ever chance to return to civilization, it will doubtless afford you much food for thought as you compare the luxuries and comforts of your life with the details of the life your son is living in the village of the Waganwazam. Again I thank you for bringing him here for me, and now I must ask that you surrender him to me, that I may turn him over to his foster parents." As he concluded, Rokoff held out his hands for the child, a nasty grin of vindictiveness upon his lips. To his surprise, Jane Clayton rose, and without a word of protest, laid the little bundle in his arms. "'Here is the child,' she said. "'Thank God he is beyond your power to harm.' Grasping the import of her words, Rokoff snatched the blanket from the child's face to seek confirmation of his fears. Jane Clayton watched his expression closely. She had been puzzled for days for an answer to the question of Rokoff's knowledge of the child's identity. If she had been in doubt before, the last shred of that doubt was wiped away as she witnessed the terrible anger of the Russian as he looked upon the dead face of the baby, and realized that at the last moment his dearest wish for vengeance had been thwarted by a higher power. Almost throwing the body of the child back into Jane Clayton's arms, Rokoff stamped up and down the hut, pounding the air with his clenched fist and cursing terribly. At last he halted in front of the young woman, bringing his face down close to hers. "'You are laughing at me!' he shrieked. "'You think that you have beaten me, eh? I'll show you, as I have shown the miserable ape you call husband, what it means to interfere with the plans of Nicholas Rokoff. You have robbed me of the child. I cannot make him the son of a cannibal chief. But—' and he paused as though to let the full meaning of his threat sink deep. "'I can make the mother the wife of a cannibal.' and that I shall do, after I have finished with her myself. If he had thought to wring from Jane Clayton any sign of terror, he failed miserably. She was beyond that. Her brain and nerves were numb to suffering and shock. To his surprise, a faint, almost happy smile touched her lips. She was thinking with thankful heart that this poor little corpse was not that of her own wee Jack, and that, best of all, Rokoff evidently did not know the truth. She would have liked to have flaunted the fact in his face, but she dared not. If he continued to believe that the child had been hers, so much safer would be the real Jack wherever he might be. She had, of course, no knowledge of the whereabouts of her little son. She did not know even that he still lived, and yet there was the chance that he might. It was more than possible that without Rokoff's knowledge this child had been substituted for hers by one of the Russians' confederates, and that even now her son might be safe with friends in London where there were many, both able and willing, to have paid any ransom which the traitorous conspirator might have asked for the safe release of Lord Greystoke's son. 
She had thought it all out a hundred times since she had discovered that the baby which Anderson had placed in her arms that night upon the Kincaid was not her own, and it had been a constant and gnawing source of happiness to her to dream the whole fantasy through in its every detail. No, the Russian must never know that this was not her baby. She realized that her position was hopeless. With Anderson and her husband dead, there was no one in all the world with a desire to succor her who knew where she might be found. Rokoff's threat, she realized, was no idle one. That he would do, or attempt to do, all that he had promised she was perfectly sure, but at the worst it meant but a little earlier release from the hideous anguish that she had been enduring. She must find some way to take her own life before the Russian could harm her further. Just now she wanted time, time to think and prepare herself for the end. She felt that she could not take the last awful step until she had exhausted every possibility of escape. She did not care to live unless she might find her way back to her own child, but, slight as such hope appeared, she would not admit its impossibility until the last moment had come, and she faced the fearful reality of choosing between the final alternatives, Nicholas Rokoff on one hand, and self-destruction upon the other. "'Go away,' she said to the Russian. "'Go away and leave me in peace with my dead. Have you not brought sufficient misery and anguish upon me without attempting to harm me further? What wrong have I ever done to you that you should persist in persecuting me? You are suffering for the sins of the monkey you chose when you might have had the love of a gentleman, of Nicholas Rokoff, he replied. But where is the use in discussing the matter? We shall bury the child here, and you will return with me at once to my own camp. Tomorrow I shall bring you back and turn you over to your new husband, the lovely Maganwazam. Come. He reached out for the child. Jane, who was on her feet now, turned away from him. I shall bury the body, she said. Send some men to dig a grave outside the village. Rokoff was anxious to have the thing over and get back to his camp with his victim. He thought he saw in her apathy a resignation to her fate. Stepping outside the hut, he motioned her to follow him, and a moment later, with his men, he escorted Jane beyond the village, where, beneath a great tree, the black scooped a shallow grave. Wrapping the tiny body in a blanket, Jane laid it tenderly in the black hole, and, turning her head that she might not see the moldy earth falling upon the pitiful little bundle, she breathed a prayer beside the grave of the nameless waif that had won its way into the innermost recesses of her heart. Then, dry-eyed but suffering, she rose and followed the Russian through the Stygian blackness of the jungle, along the winding leafy corridor that led from the village of Maganwazam, the black cannibal, into the camp of Nicholas Rokoff, the white fiend. Beside them, in the impenetrable thickets that fringed the path, rising to arch above it and shut out the moon, the girl could hear the stealthy, muffled footfalls of great beasts, and ever round about them rose the deafening roars of hunting lions, until the earth trembled to the mighty sound. The porters lighted torches now, and waved them upon either hand to frighten off the beast of prey. Rokoff urged them to greater speed, and from the quavering note in his voice Jane Clayton knew that he was weak from terror. The sounds of the jungle night recalled most vividly the days and nights that she had spent in a similar jungle with her forest god with the fearless and unconquerable Tarzan of the apes. Then there had been no thoughts of terror, though the jungle noises were new to her, and the roar of the lion had seemed the most awe-inspiring sound upon the great earth. How different it would be now if she knew that he was somewhere there in the wilderness seeking her. Then indeed would there be that for which to live, and every reason to believe that succor was close at hand. But he was dead. It was incredible that it should be so. There seemed no place in death for that great body, and those mighty thews. Had Rokoff been the one to tell her of her lord's passing, she would have known that he lied. There could be no reason, she thought, why Maganwazam should have deceived her. She did not know that the Russian had talked with the savage a few minutes before the chief had come to her with his tale. At last they reached the rude boma that Rokoff's porters had thrown up around the Russian's camp. Here they found all in turmoil. She did not know what it was all about, but she saw that Rokoff was very angry and from bits of conversation which she could translate, she gleaned that there had been further desertions while he had been absent, and that the deserters had taken the bulk of his food and ammunition. When he had done venting his rage upon those who remained, he returned to where Jane stood under guard of a couple of his white sailors. He grasped her roughly by the arm and started to drag her toward his tent. The girl struggled and fought to free herself, while the two sailors stood by, laughing at the rare treat. Rokoff did not hesitate to use rough methods when he found that he was to have difficulty in carrying out his designs. Repeatedly he struck Jane Clayton in the face, until at last, half-conscious, she was dragged within his tent. 
Rokoff's boy had lighted the Russian's lamp, and now at a word from his master he made himself scarce. Jane had sunk to the floor in the middle of the enclosure. Slowly her numb senses were returning to her, and she was commencing to think very fast indeed. Quickly her eyes ran round the interior of the tent, taking in every detail of its equipment and contents. Now the Russian was lifting her to her feet, and attempting to drag her to the camp cot that stood at one side of the tent. At his belt hung a heavy revolver. Jane Clayton's eyes riveted themselves upon it. Her palm itched to grasp the huge butt. She feigned again to swoon, but through her half-closed lids she waited her opportunity. It came just as Rokoff was lifting her upon the cot. A noise at the tent door behind him brought his head quickly about and away from the girl. The butt of the gun was not an inch from her hand. With a single, lightning-like move she snatched the weapon from its holster, and at the same instant Rokoff turned back toward her, realizing his peril. She did not dare fire for fear the shot would bring his people about him, and with Rokoff dead she would fall into hands no better than his, into a fate probably even worse than he alone could have imagined. The memory of the two brutes who stood and laughed as Rokoff struck her was still vivid. As the rage and fear-filled countenance of the Slav turned toward her, Jane Clayton raised the heavy revolver high above the pasty face, and with all her strength dealt the man a terrific blow between the eyes. Without a sound he sank, limp and unconscious to the ground. A moment later the girl stood beside him, for a moment at least, free from the menace of his lust. Outside the tent she again heard the noise that had distracted Rokoff's attention. What it was she did not know, but fearing the return of the servant and the discovery of her deed she stepped quickly to the camp table, upon which burned the oil lamp and extinguished the smudgy, evil-smelling flame. In the total darkness of the interior she paused for a moment to collect her wits and plan for the next step in her venture for freedom. About her was a camp of enemies. Beyond those foes the black wilderness of savage jungle people by hideous beasts of prey, and still more hideous human beasts. There was little or no chance that she could survive even a few days of the constant dangers that would confront her there, but the knowledge that she had already passed through so many perils unscathed, and that somewhere out in the faraway world a little child was doubtless at that very moment crying for her, filled her with the determination to make the effort to accomplish the seemingly impossible, and cross that awful land of horror in search of the sea, and the remote chance of succor that she might find there. Rokoff's tent stood almost exactly in the center of the boma. Surrounding it were the tents and shelters of his white companions and the natives of his safari. To pass through these and find egress through the boma seemed a task too fraught with insurmountable obstacles to warrant even the slightest consideration, and yet there was no other way. To remain in the tent until she should be discovered would be to set at naught all that she had risked to gain her freedom. And so with stealthy step and every sense alert she approached the back of the tent to set out upon the first stage of her adventure. Groping along the rear of the canvas wall, she found that there was no opening there. Quickly she returned to the side of the unconscious Russian. In his belt her groping fingers came upon the hilt of a long hunting knife, and with this she cut a hole in the back wall of the tent. Silently she stepped without. To her immense relief she saw that the camp was apparently asleep. In the dim and flickering light of the dying fire she saw but a single sentry, and he was dozing upon his haunches at the opposite side of the enclosure. Keeping the tent between him and herself, she crossed between the small shelters of the native porters to the boma wall beyond. Outside, in the darkness of the tangled jungle, she could hear the roaring of lions, the laughing of hyenas, and the countless nameless noises of the midnight jungle. For a moment she hesitated, trembling. The thought of the prowling beast out there in the darkness was appalling. Then, with a sudden brave toss of her head, she attacked the thorny boma wall with her delicate hands. Torn and bleeding though they were, she worked on breathlessly until she had made an opening through which she could worm her body, and then at last she stood outside the enclosure. Behind her lay a fate worse than death, at the hands of human beings. Before her lay an almost certain fate, but it was only death, sudden, merciful, and honorable death. Without a tremor, and without regard, she darted away from the camp, and a moment later the mysterious jungle had closed about her. End of Chapter 13 14 of the Beast of Tarzan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. The Beast of Tarzan by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 14 Alone in the Jungle. <laughs>
Tambudza, leading Tarzan of the Apes toward the camp of the Russian, moved very slowly along the winding jungle path, for she was old and her legs stiff with rheumatism. So it was that the runners dispatched by Maganwazam to warn Rokoff that the white giant was in his village, and that he would be slain that night reached the Russian's camp before Tarzan and his ancient guide had covered half the distance. The guides found the white man's camp in a turmoil. Rokoff had that morning been discovered stunned and bleeding within his tent. When he had recovered his senses and realized that Jane Clayton had escaped, his rage was boundless. Rushing about the camp with his rifle, he had sought to shoot down the native sentries who had allowed the young woman to elude their vigilance. But several of the other whites, realizing that they were already in a precarious position, owing to the numerous desertions that Rokoff's cruelty had brought about, seized and disarmed him. Then came the messengers from Maganwazam. But scarcely had they told their story, and Rokoff was preparing to depart with them for their village, when other runners, panting from their exertions of their swift flight through the jungle, rushed breathless into the firelight, crying that the white giant had escaped from Maganwazam, and was already on his way to wreak vengeance against his enemies. Instantly, confusion reigned within the encircling boma. The blacks belonging to Rokoff's safari were terror-stricken at the thought of the proximity of the white giant, who hunted through the jungle with a fierce pack of apes and panthers at his heels. Before the whites realized what had happened, the superstitious fears of the natives had sent them scurrying into the bush, their own carriers as well as the messengers from Maganwazam. But even in their haste, they had not neglected to take with them every article of value upon which they could lay their hands. Thus Rokoff and the seven white sailors found themselves deserted and robbed in the midst of a wilderness. The Russian, following his usual custom, berated his companions, laying all the blame upon their shoulders for the events which had led up to the almost hopeless condition in which they now found themselves. But the sailors were in no mood to brook his insults and his cursing. In the midst of this tirade, one of them drew a revolver and fired point-blank at the Russian. The fellow's aim was poor, but his act so terrified Rokoff that he turned and fled for his tent. As he ran, his eyes chanced to pass beyond the boma to the edge of the forest, and there he caught a glimpse of that which sent his craven heart cold with a fear that almost expunged his terror of the seven men at his back, who by this time were all firing in hate and revenge at his retreating figure. What he saw was the giant figure of an almost naked white man emerging from the bush. Darting into his tent, the Russian did not halt in his flight, but kept right on through the rear wall, taking advantage of the long slit that Jane Clayton had made the night before. The terror-stricken Muscovite scurried like a hunted rabbit through the hole that still gaped in the boma's wall at the point where his own prey had escaped, and as Tarzan approached the camp upon the opposite side, Rokoff disappeared into the jungle in the wake of Jane Clayton. As the ape-man entered the boma with old Tambudza at his elbow, the seven sailors recognizing him turned and fled in the opposite direction. Tarzan saw that Rokoff was not among them, and so he let them go their way. His business was with the Russian, whom he expected to find in his tent. As to the sailors, he was sure that the jungle would exact from them expiation for their villainies. Nor, doubtless, was he wrong, for his were the last white man's eyes to rest upon any of them. Finding Rokoff's tent empty, Tarzan was about to set out in search of the Russian, when Tembudza suggested to him that the departure of the white man could only have resulted from word reaching him from Maganwazam that Tarzan was in his village. "'He has doubtless hasted there,' argued the old woman. "'If you would find him, let us return at once.' Tarzan himself thought that this would probably prove to be the fact, and so he did not waste time in an endeavor to locate the Russian's trail, but instead set out briskly for the village of Maganwazam, leaving Tambudza to plod slowly in his wake. His one hope was that Jane was still safe and with Rokoff. If this was of the case, it would be but a matter of an hour or more before he should be able to wrest her from the Russian. He knew now that Maganwazam was treacherous, and that he might have to fight to regain possession of his wife. He wished that Mugambi, Sheeta, Akut, and the balance of the pack were with him, for he realized that single-handed it would be no child's play to bring Jane safely from the clutches of two such scoundrels as Rokoff and the wily Maganwazam. To his surprise he found no sign of either Rokoff or Jane in the village, and as he could not trust the word of the chief, he wasted no time in futile inquiry. So sudden and unexpected had been his return, and so quickly had he vanished into the jungle after learning that those he sought were not among the Waganwazam, that old Maganwazam had no time to prevent his going. Swinging through the trees, he hastened back to the deserted camp he had so recently left, for here he knew was the logical place to take up the trail of Rokoff and Jane. Arrived at the boma, he circled carefully about the outside of the enclosure until, opposite a break in the thorny wall, he came to indications that something had recently passed into the jungle. His acute sense of smell told him that both of those he sought had fled from the camp in this direction, 
and a moment later he had taken up the trail and was following the faint spoor. Far ahead of him, a terror-stricken young woman was slinking along a narrow game trail, fearful that the next moment would bring her face to face with some savage beast or equally savage man. As she ran on, hoping against hope that she had hit upon the direction that would lead her eventually to the great river, she came suddenly upon a familiar spot. At one side of the trail, beneath a giant tree, lay a little heap of loosely piled brush. To her dying day, that little spot of jungle would be indelibly impressed upon her memory. It was where Anderson had hidden her, where he had given up his life in the vain effort to save her from Rokoff. At sight of it, she recalled the rifle and ammunition that the man had thrust upon her at the last moment. Until now she had forgotten them entirely. Still clutched in her hand was the revolver she had snatched from Rokoff's belt, but that could contain at most not over six cartridges, not enough to furnish her with food and protection both on the long journey to the sea. With bated breath she groped beneath the little mound, scarce daring to hope that the treasure remained where she had left it. But to her infinite relief and joy her hand came at once upon the barrel of the heavy weapon, and then upon the bandolier of cartridges. As she threw the latter about her shoulder and felt the weight of the big game gun in her hand, a sudden sense of security suffused her. It was with new hope and a feeling of almost assured success that she again set forward upon her journey. That night she slept in the crotch of a tree, as Tarzan had so often told her he was accustomed to doing, and early the next morning was upon her way again. Late in the afternoon, as she was about to cross a little clearing, she was startled at the sight of a huge ape coming from the jungle upon the opposite side. The wind was blowing directly across the clearing between them, and Jane lost no time in putting herself downwind from the huge creature. Then she hid in a clump of heavy bush, and watched, holding the rifle ready for instant use. To her consternation she saw that the apes were pausing in the center of the clearing. They came together in a little knot, where they stood, looking backward, as though in expectation of the coming of others of their tribe. Jane wished they would go on, for she knew that at any moment some little eddying gust of wind might carry her scent down to their nostrils, and then what would the protection of her rifle amount to in the face of those gigantic muscles and mighty fangs? Her eyes moved back and forth between the apes and the edge of the jungle toward which they were gazing, until at last she perceived the object of their halt, and the thing that they awaited. They were being stalked. Of this she was positive, as she saw the lithe, sinewy form of a panther glide noiselessly from the jungle at the point at which the apes had emerged but a moment before. Quickly the beast trotted across the clearing toward the anthropoids. Jane wondered at their apparent apathy, and a moment later her wonder turned to amazement as she saw the great cat come quite close to the apes, who, apparently entirely unconcerned by its presence, and squatting down in their midst, fell assiduously to the business of preening, which occupies most of the waking hours of the cat family. If the young woman was surprised by the sight of these natural enemies fraternizing, it was with emotions little short of fear for her own sanity that she presently saw a tall, muscular warrior enter the clearing and join the group of savage beasts assembled there. At first sight of the man she had been positive that he would be torn to pieces, and she had half risen from her shelter, raising her rifle to her shoulder to do what she could to avert the man's terrible fate. Now she saw that he seemed actually conversing with the beast, issuing orders to them. Presently the entire company filed on across the clearing and disappeared into the jungle upon the opposite side. With a gasp of mingled incredulity and relief, Jane Clayton staggered to her feet and fled on away from the terrible horde that had just passed her, while half a mile behind her another individual, following the same trail as she, lay frozen with terror behind an anthill as the hideous band passed quite close to him. This one was Rokoff, but he had recognized the members of the awful aggregation as allies of Tarzan of the Apes. No sooner, therefore, had the beast passed him than he rose and raced through the jungle as fast as he could go in order that he might put as much distance as possible between himself and these frightful beasts. So it happened that as Jane Clayton came to the bank of the river, down which she hoped to float to the ocean and eventual rescue, Nicholas Rokoff was but a short distance in her rear. Upon the bank the girl saw a great dugout drawn halfway from the water and tied securely to a nearby tree. This, she felt, would solve the question of transportation to the sea, could she but launch the huge unwieldy craft. Unfastening the rope that had moored it to the tree, Jane pushed frantically upon the bow of the heavy canoe, but for all the results that were apparent she might as well have been attempting to shove the earth out of its orbit. She was about winded when it occurred to her to try working the dugout into the stream by loading the stern with ballast and then rocking the bow back and forth along the bank until the craft eventually worked itself into the river. There were no stones or rocks available, but along the shore she found quantities of driftwood deposited by the river at a slightly higher stage. These she gathered and piled far into the stern of the boat 
until at last, to her immense relief, she saw the bow rise gently from the mud of the bank, and the stern drift slowly with the current until it again lodged a few feet farther downstream. Jane found that by running back and forth between the bow and the stern, she could alternately raise and lower each end of the boat as she shifted her weight from one end to the other, with the result that each time she leaped to the stern, the canoe moved a few inches farther into the river. As the success of her plan approached more closely to fruition, she became so wrapped in her efforts that she failed to note the figure of a man standing beneath a huge tree at the edge of the jungle from which he had just emerged. He watched her and her labors with a cruel and malicious grin upon his swarthy countenance. The boat at last became so nearly free of the retarding mud and of the bank that Jane felt positive that she could pull it off into deeper water with one of the paddles which lay in the bottom of the rude craft. With this end in view, she seized upon one of these implements, and had just plunged it into the river bottom close to the shore when her eyes happened to rise to the edge of the jungle. As her gaze fell upon the figure of the man, a little cry of terror rose to her lips. It was Rokoff. He was running toward her now, and shouting to her to wait or he would shoot. Though he was entirely unarmed, it was difficult to discover just how he intended making good his threat. Jane Clayton knew nothing of the various misfortunes that had befallen the Russian since he had escaped from his tent, so she believed that his followers must be close at hand. However, she had no intention of falling again into the man's clutches. She would rather die at once than that that should happen to her. Another minute and the boat would be free. Once in the current of the river, she would be beyond Rokoff's power to stop her, for there was no other boat upon the shore, and no man certainly not the cowardly Rokoff, would dare to attempt to swim the crocodile-infested waters in an effort to overtake her. Rokoff, on his part, was bent more upon escape than aught else. He would gladly have forgone any designs he might have had upon Jane Clayton, would she but permit him to share this means of escape that she had discovered. He would promise anything if she would let him come aboard the dugout, but he did not think that it was necessary to do so. He saw that he could easily reach the bow of the boat before it cleared the shore and then it would not be necessary to make promises of any sort. Not that Rokoff would have felt the slightest compunction in ignoring any promises he might have made the girl, but he disliked the idea of having to sue for favor with one who had so recently assaulted and escaped him. Already he was gloating over the days and nights of revenge that would be his while the heavy dugout drifted its slow way to the ocean. Jane Clayton, working furiously to shove the boat beyond his reach, suddenly realized that she was to be successful for with a little lurch the dugout swung quickly into the current, just as the Russian reached out to place his hand upon the bow. His fingers did not miss their goal by a half-dozen inches. The girl almost collapsed with the reaction from the terrific mental, physical, and nervous strain under which she had been laboring for the past few minutes. But, thank heaven, at last she was safe. Even as she breathed a silent prayer of thanksgiving, she saw a sudden expression of triumph lighten the features of the cursing Russian, and at the same instant he dropped suddenly to the ground, grasping firmly upon something which wriggled through the mud toward the water. Jane Clayton crouched, wide-eyed and horror-stricken in the bottom of the boat as she realized at the last instant success had been turned to failure, and that she was indeed again in the power of the malignant Rokoff. For the thing the man had seen and grasped was the end of the trailing rope with which the dugout had been moored to the tree. End of chapter 14